Towering 450 feet above the Egyptian desert lies the Great Pyramid of Giza, its rugged, crumbling facade a mere ruin of its former glory. It was once clad in blinding white limestone, fits so tightly together the seams were invisible. A capstone of pure gold crowned the top, reflecting the sun's light for miles like a beacon of triumph for a flourishing civilization. The textbooks teach us that the Great Pyramid was built around 4,500 years ago as a tomb for the pharaoh Khufu. But did you know that might not be true at all? Let's fix that. I'm Shayla Fontaine, and you're listening to History Fix, where I discuss lesser-known true stories from history you won't be able to stop thinking about. This week, we're talking about the Great Pyramid, which is the tallest of the Egyptian pyramids in Giza. The Great Pyramid is the last surviving of the Seven Wonders of the World, and it is truly a wonder, as in people have been wondering a lot of things about it for a very long time. Although it's been around for thousands of years, I mean, it was already ancient in the days of King Tut, we're still making new discoveries. Just a couple months ago, a sealed off chamber was discovered on the north side of the pyramid. In 2017, a 98 foot long corridor no one knew was there. But it seems like the more we discover, the more confused we become, and the more the experts disagree. So I'm going to brief you on the traditional mainstream ideas about the Great Pyramid, what the Egyptologists would have you believe. But then I'm going to blow your mind with some alternate theories that make a whole lot of sense. If you haven't listened to last week's episode about Nikola Tesla yet, I suggest going back and listening to that one first. I know, I know. What could Nikola Tesla possibly have to do with ancient Egypt? Well, maybe a whole lot, believe it or not. You'll still dig this episode if you skipped that one. I'll recap some important Tesla stuff. But it'd be cooler if you had Tesla under your belt already. Trust me. So here's what the textbooks say, more or less. The first pyramid was built around 2780 BC by an architect named Imhotep as a tomb for the pharaoh Djoser. Before that, tombs were rectangular mounds called mastabas. Picture a pyramid and then chop the top 80% off. That's a mastaba. So Imhotep built six mastabas on top of each other, each one smaller than the one beneath it, like a wedding cake. Actually, the word pyramid came from the Greek word pyramis, which meant wheat cake. Ancient Egyptians did not call them pyramids. They were called myrrh until the Greeks arrived 2,000 years later and were like, hey, it looks like a cake. From now until eternity, the entire world is going to call it pyramid and also the geometric figure. That's cake too. So yeah, pyramid means cake. Imhotep's pyramid is referred to as a step pyramid because it looks like stairs. The first smooth-sided pyramid was apparently built 100 or 200 years later by King Snefru. It started as a step pyramid and then the sides were filled in and it was covered in limestone casing so that it appeared smooth. Now the Great Pyramid, so they say, was built as a tomb for Snefru's son, Khufu, and it was truly massive. Its base covered 13 acres, and its sides were over 755 feet long, making the structure rise to 480 feet. Today, it's only 450 feet because, you know, erosion and stuff. We're talking about 2.5 million stone blocks, ranging from 2 to 15 tons each. The stones we see today, the reddish-brown rocks, are limestone that was sourced from pretty close to the site. The white limestone that used to encase the outside, giving it a smooth appearance, came from Tura, which is across the Nile, like 10 miles away. But the granite used in some interior rooms came from Aswan, which is 500 miles to the south. Like, it's a 10 and a half hour drive. I just checked Google Maps. And we're talking about granite slabs weighing 70 tons each. Massive. That's 140,000 pounds for one block. It's an incredible engineering feat, even for today. But when you consider the technology and tools that we know the ancient Egyptians had, it's practically impossible. So how do the textbooks explain the construction? Well, Egyptians had copper tools, like 
chisels, drills, and saws that they could have used to cut soft stone. But granite is not a soft stone. Experts believe the workmen used some kind of abrasive powder, like sand, with their copper drills and saws. But I don't know, that's not much of an explanation to me. Like, oh, they just threw some sand on there and and it was all good. They go on to explain that water-filled trenches were likely used to level the perimeter. The base of the pyramid is leveled within three-fourths of an inch. Today, the only way to do that is with lasers. But water-filled trenches sound just as good. The granite from Aswan was probably floated up the Nile on barges during the rainy season, and then the stone blocks were moved, basically like big sleds. They were on big sleds pushed over wet ground. So they wet the dirt, turning it into slippery mud, so the blocks could just sort of slide on for miles and miles and miles. And then they built ramps to get the rocks up hundreds of feet to their positions in the pyramid and just pushed them right on up there. And all of this was likely done by a crew of around 20,000 men, and it probably took about 20 years to complete. So that's how they explain it wet dirt, and ramps. However, these mainstream Egyptologists gloss over some pretty crucial stuff. Remember those massive 70-ton hunks of granite? Well, above the king's chamber are five more chambers, all separated by these huge granite slabs. They not only cut them, apparently with copper saws and sand, and transported them 500 miles, they also hoisted them up 350 feet in the air. The ramp theory is not practical when you consider that. Based on the laws of physics, you would not be able to get a rock of that size and weight up a ramp with more than a 10 degree incline. It's physically impossible. At 10 degrees, the ramp would have to be massive itself, as grand as the pyramid itself. It's just not a feasible theory. Another glossed over area is the precision with which the pyramid was built. A Smithsonian article states, quote, knowledge of astronomy was necessary to orient the pyramids to the cardinal points, end quote. Okay, now let me blow your mind with how much of an understatement that is. First of all, The Great Pyramid is aligned within one-fifteenth of a degree of true north. And considering Egyptians did not have compasses, that's very impressive. But their ability to orient themselves within the universe does not stop there. We know that equinoxes were really important to ancient civilizations, Egyptians included. An equinox is when the day and night are the exact same length, 12 hours each. And this only happens twice a year the vernal equinox at the end of March, and the autumnal equinox at the end of September. They mark the beginning of spring and the beginning of fall, and they were a big deal in ancient times. Okay, so why am I talking about equinoxes? Well, the length of the day slash night on an equinox is exactly 12 hours. That's 720 minutes, or 43,200 seconds. 43,200 seconds of daylight and 43,200 seconds of night. Ancient Egyptians invented the 24-hour day with 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute, so this was still true then. 43,200 seconds. If you multiply that number times the height of the pyramid, you get 3,938.685 miles, which is within 11 miles of the polar radius of the planet. 11 miles is not much when you're talking about the whole planet. That's 99.7% accuracy. But I'm not done. If you multiply that number, 43,200, by the perimeter of the base of the pyramid, you get 24,734.94 miles, which is the circumference of the Earth within 99.3% accuracy. Skeptics say this is just a coincidence. One heck of a coincidence, I must say. My math teacher brain is just worrying. I mean, the odds of that happening by chance are just, there's just no. So what this tells me is that whoever built the Great Pyramid somehow knew the size of the Earth with almost 100% accuracy. The construction itself is wild, but it makes sense that they would have gone above and beyond. Most archaeologists believe the Great Pyramid was built as a tomb for the pharaoh Khufu during the 4th dynasty around 2500 BC. 
In ancient Egypt, pharaohs were practically gods. They were believed to have been chosen by the gods as their mediators on Earth, and when they died, they became Osiris, god of the dead. So it was in the best interest of the Egyptian people to honor them after death so as not to get smite, smitten, smote. But they also believed that part of the pharaoh's spirit remained with his body. This is why they mummified the bodies and entombed them with everything they would need in the afterlife. Food, furniture, gold. We know this mostly because of the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun, which I talk about in episode 6 about Highclere Castle. That was really the only intact pharaoh's tomb ever discovered. The others had all been plundered by grave robbers long ago. Artifacts removed, mummies exposed, and left to rot. But we know about these burial traditions because of Tut. Tune into that one, episode 6, if you missed it. And def check out the photos of Tut's tomb on my Instagram, at History Fix Podcast. They're really cool. You can see the chariot pieces, chairs, these crazy cat sculpture things. It'll give you a good idea of what Egyptian tombs looked like before they were inevitably robbed. Dead pharaohs didn't just need stuff, though. They also needed their people. Three small pyramids built for Khufu's queens are lined up next to the Great Pyramid, and it's also surrounded by rows of mastabas that would have been for his relatives and officials so they could support him, you know, keep him company in the afterlife. So the Great Pyramid, the biggest one that we're talking about, is the northernmost of the three Great Pyramids of Giza. The one in the middle, the second biggest, was built for Khufu's son, Khafra, and the smallest of the three to the south was built for Khafra's son, Menkora. So the pyramid complex of Giza is essentially a family graveyard on a very grand scale. The Sphinx is there too, of course, a giant guardian statue with the head of a man and the body of a lion. So they're tombs, right? They're just really elaborate tombs. Well, interestingly enough, no mummy has ever been found in an Egyptian pyramid, which is weird. But not crazy. I mean, we know grave robbers had looted all but Tut's tomb, so it's not crazy that mummies in the pyramids didn't make it. They weren't exactly well hidden, these tombs. They were a little obvious. Eventually, Egyptians wised up and started building tombs to be much more discreet, hidden, but not in the days of Khufu. Another weird anomaly about the Great Pyramid is that it doesn't have elaborate wall art or hieroglyphics like we see in other tombs. It's pretty plain, unadorned, which breaks with the Egyptian tradition for sure. Tombs were usually covered in writing, paintings, and relief sculptures. According to the Australian Museum, in ancient Egypt, art was magical. Whether in the form of painting, sculpture, carving, or script, art had the power to maintain universal order and grant immortal life by appealing to various gods to act on behalf of people, both in life and in death. Art was also a crucial inclusion in the elaborate tombs that housed the mummified remains of people. Tomb art was considered the point of contact between the land of the living and the land of the dead. So I find it quite strange that Khufu's tomb, the great pyramid that took over 20 years to build with massive granite blocks from 500 miles away, all that work and effort that went into it, and yet there's no artwork. There are no tomb paintings or relief carvings in the great pyramid. Is it possible that there was artwork and it just didn't survive? I mean, I guess. I don't know, though. You can still see tool marks on the rocks from construction. It seems like a relief carving would have survived, too. There is a granite sarcophagus, a stone box in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. This is where Khufu's mummy was once thought to rest. Although, who knows what happened to the actual mummy. There's no evidence a mummy was ever in the box. It's just assumed, because it, it looks very coffin-like. But even this sarcophagus is very different from other intact sarcophagi. Is that, is it one of those words, like cacti? I think so. In the Valley of the Kings, sarcophagi are handmade looking. They're not precise. They're rounded and clumsy, roughly hewn. We talked about Tutankhamun's sarcophagus in episode 6. It was a massive gilded box, 16 feet long, with another box inside it, another box in that. It was a whole thing. The so-called sarcophagus in the Great Pyramid is nothing like that. It's a plain stone box, and it's super precise. Right angles, laser-like cuts, drill holes. Plus, it looks like it exploded at some point. Part of it looks like it got blown off. We'll come back to that. So all this to say, for the most elaborate and exquisite tomb in all of ancient Egypt, the Great Pyramid 
isn't very tomb-like at all. It leads one to wonder if maybe it wasn't actually built to be a tomb. Maybe it served a different purpose entirely. An alternate theory arose in the 1970s, and at the time it was a fringe theory, which is just a nice way of saying that most people thought it was utter nonsense. But as more and more evidence has been uncovered in recent years, this theory is making more and more sense. And it's not really on the fringe anymore. It's holding its own. So this theory goes back to the construction of the pyramid, which we've touched on. Limestone is a conductor. It can carry an electrical current, but not not the white Tura limestone that encased the outside. It's special. Tura limestone lacks magnesium, which makes it an insulator. Electrical currents can't pass through it. Now, those massive granite slabs in the interior rooms, the ones they got from 500 miles away, those are rose granite. We know they were very intentional with this choice, obviously, because they transported them 500 miles. But why? Well, rose granite has a lot of quartz in it. A lot of quartz, like 85% quartz. When quartz is compressed or vibrates, moves, it creates an electrical charge called piezoelectricity. One face of the quartz has a positive charge and the other has a negative charge. And when you connect them, you have an electrical current. This is why quartz is used in watches, clocks, TVs, radios, GPS, microphones, etc. So we have all this quartz inside the pyramid that could generate electricity under pressure. And we have the insulating white Tura limestone covering the outside of the pyramid containing the electricity inside the structure. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that the Great Pyramid wasn't a tomb at all. It was a power plant. Yeah, I know. That was the last thing you were expecting. Ancient Egyptians didn't have electricity, right? Just hear me out. Beneath the Great Pyramid are underground chambers, aquifers saturated with groundwater. As the water moves underground, it creates sound waves that resonate with the Earth's natural vibration. This vibration comes from the moon's gravitational pull, which is also what makes the tides rise and fall, so a lot of energy there. The sound waves from the underground aquifers travel up through the pyramid, causing the granite, the quartz, to vibrate, which creates that piezoelectricity we talked about earlier. What's more, there are traces of chemicals in the queen's chamber that, when combined, would have created hydrogen gas. This gas would have flowed through the Grand Gallery, building up and compressing the granite, making more electricity. At the top of the gallery is a small shaft leading to the king's chamber, the perfect size for hydrogen microwaves to pass through. This brings us back to the five layers of 70-ton granite beams suspended above the king's chamber, separated by air gaps. These are called relieving chambers because they were believed to relieve the weight of the pyramid. But they don't actually do this. They provide no structural support. What's interesting about these beams is they have smooth sides but rough-cut tops. Some believe the beams were cut this way on purpose, in order to resonate at a certain pitch when vibrated. They were essentially tuned like giant musical instruments, Helmholtz resonators. Like, have you ever blown across the top of a bottle or run your finger along the rim of a glass to make sound? Those are Helmholtz resonators. Changing the amount of liquid in the bottle or glass changes the pitch of the sound. And it's believed the granite slabs were intentionally carved to resonate at 440 hertz, an F-sharp chord, which is supposedly in harmony with the vibration of the Earth. In 2018, scientists used radio waves to prove that the pyramid can concentrate electromagnetic energy in its chambers and under its base. So basically, the power plant theory claims they were using sound waves and pressure from hydrogen gas to vibrate the quartz inside the pyramid, creating electricity. The regular limestone blocks conducted the electricity, and the white Tura limestone on the outside insulated it, trapping it inside the pyramid. The gold capstone would have drawn the electricity up and out the top of the pyramid and into the atmosphere. So really, it's a big tower that uses the natural vibration of the Earth to generate unlimited, free, clean energy. Sound familiar? Well, if you listen to the Tesla episode, like I told you to, it should sound very familiar. Remember Wardenclyffe Tower? 
I'll recap it for you. So in the early 1900s, Nikola Tesla was working on radio technology. He was basically in a race with an Italian inventor named Marconi to invent the radio. He got funding from J.P. Morgan, who was an extremely wealthy American businessman investor guy, and he used the money to build Wardenclyffe Tower on Long Island in New York. But Tesla didn't just want to mess with radio waves. He wanted to create a system of worldwide wireless free energy by capturing the Earth's natural energy and transmitting it through a series of towers like the one at Wardenclyffe through the Earth's upper atmosphere. This would mean no fossil fuels, no burning coal and power plants to generate electricity, no power lines, no wires. The electricity would be transmitted through the air. It would be completely clean and renewable and free. Sounds incredible, right? Well, not to everyone. Not to J.P. Morgan, whose fortune was built on our complete dependence on fossil fuels. Morgan cut off Tesla's funding and told all the other investors not to have anything to do with him. He was blacklisted, and in 1917, Wardenclyffe Tower was demolished for scrap to pay off some of his debts. The project was unfortunately abandoned. Tesla's knowledge about this alternate free energy source was likely recorded in the 80 boxes of papers he toted around with him for the rest of his life. But after his death, the boxes were confiscated by the U.S. government, and when they were returned, there were suddenly only 60 boxes, not the original 80. It seems this revolutionary idea died with Nikola Tesla, or was killed, rather, by the U.S. government. But this is a history podcast, not a conspiracy podcast, so I will stop the speculation right there. In 2017, ground-penetrating radar was used at Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower site to confirm the existence of hundreds of feet of underground tunnels that ran under the tower, the purpose of which is still unknown. What's interesting is the Great Pyramid also has a series of underground tunnels. Proponents of the power plant theory think these tunnels and aquifers were where sound waves were generated based on the natural vibrations of Earth. The sound waves then traveled up through the pyramid, vibrating the quartz to produce electricity, which was channeled up through the gold capstone and into Earth's atmosphere, presumably reaching those in need of electricity. It seems Tesla didn't invent this concept at all. He rediscovered what someone in ancient Egypt apparently already knew. So if that's the case, if that's true, why is there no record of electricity in ancient Egyptian writing? Egyptians wrote everything down. They were meticulous note takers. Egyptians were like middle school girls with diaries. If they had electricity, there would surely be some record of it. Well, maybe that technology was lost well before the days of Khufu and the Fourth Dynasty. Maybe they were just as puzzled by the Great Pyramid as we are. There are some who believe the Great Pyramids of Giza are actually far older than we think they are, for a couple reasons. First, we know the layout of the three pyramids. Their positions are very reminiscent of Orion's belt in the constellation Orion. You know the one, the the three bright stars close together that are almost in a straight line. The pyramids look a whole lot like Orion's belt, but they don't line up with the constellation itself. Not now, anyway. They may have once, though. They would have lined up with Orion's belt around 13,500 years ago. The Sphinx faces east, where the constellation Leo, you know, like the lion, would have risen on the vernal equinox 13,500 years ago. Robert Schock, a professor of natural sciences at Boston University, believes the Sphinx and the pyramids at Giza are actually 13,500 years old, not 4,500 as we've always believed. Now, that's a difference of 9,000 years. That's a major difference. How could we possibly be off by that many millennia? That got me wondering why we think they were built 4,500 years ago. How sure are we about that? You can't carbon date limestone. So what evidence pointed to 4,500 years ago during the reign of Khufu? Well, according to a PBS interview with archaeologist Mark Linner, it's all very circumstantial. Linner says... There's no one easy way that we know what the date of the pyramids happens to be. It's mostly by context. The pyramids are surrounded by cemeteries of other tombs. In these tombs, we find bodies. Sometimes we find organic materials like fragments of reed and wood, wooden coffins. We find the bones of people who lived and were buried in these tombs. 
All that can be radiocarbon dated, for example. But primarily, we date the pyramids by their position in the development of Egyptian architecture and material culture over the broad sweep of 3,000 years. So we're not dealing with any one foothold of factual knowledge at Giza itself. We're dealing with basically the entirety of Egyptology and Egyptian archaeology. It's all just circumstantial. And sometimes we smile at that because virtually all information in archaeology is circumstantial, end quote. So that's, yeah, I don't know, that's not beyond a shadow of a doubt for me. Is it possible that Khufu used the pyramid but didn't actually build it? Is it possible the pyramid was already there and the Egyptians 4,500 years ago just repurposed it? It seems that's possible. There's no definitive proof against it. But archaeologists' main issue with this theory is that there's no evidence of an advanced civilization living in that area 13,500 years ago. No artifacts whatsoever. According to Linner, there's no way there could have been a complex civilization at a place like Giza or anywhere in the Nile Valley and they didn't leave a trace. Because people eat, people poop, people leave their garbage around, and they leave their traces. They leave the traces of humanity, end quote. Unless something destroyed all the traces? Author Graham Hancock is a proponent of the ancient apocalypse theory. He believes a catastrophic event occurred on Earth about 12,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age. Some believe it was a massive solar event, a violent plasma storm that overwhelmed our magnetosphere, inundating the Earth with solar radiation. This would have caused massive lightning strikes, hundreds or thousands of times more powerful than lightning from a typical thunderstorm. In fact, melted rock has been found in 120 different countries and on the moon. Rock that has been melted into glass in a process called vitrification. It takes some serious heat and power to do that. Around this time, we have the extinction of woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers, who we thought just sort of died from climate change as the Ice Age ended. But what if they were actually killed in a matter of a few days of exposure to lethal radiation from this solar event? Most humans would have died. Only those who took shelter in underground caves could have survived. The ice caps, which were much larger then because of the Ice Age, they would have melted instantly, causing a great flood, like Noah's Ark-style flood. And really, every culture and religion has a flood myth. The ancient Egyptian creation story begins with a great flood. The lost city of Atlantis fits into this timeline. If it existed, it would have been lost in a flood like that. There's even evidence of a great flood in Giza. The base of the Sphinx shows signs of extreme water erosion that could only happen if a lot of fast-moving water flooded the area in the desert. So something obviously happened at the end of the last ice age. Is it possible that event wiped out the advanced civilizations that actually built the pyramids, launching us into a dark age that we're only now beginning to crawl out of? Something like that, the the giant lightning, that would certainly have damaged the Great Pyramid, right? Destroyed it. Well, no, not entirely, but it definitely could have messed with the power plant inside. And it appears that's exactly what happened. At some point, there was an explosion inside the Great Pyramid. In 2001, scorch marks were discovered in the ceiling of the Grand Gallery. Cracks in the granite beams in the King's Chamber were thought to have been caused by an earthquake. But they're only found in areas where the flow of hydrogen would have happened. The walls in the king's chamber were also pushed out by over an inch. It takes a lot of force to move tons of granite like that. The great step outside the king's chamber is damaged as if from an explosion, and so is the sarcophagus we talked about earlier. There are traces of sulfuric acid and ammonium chloride in some of the chambers. These two chemicals can explode if mixed together. If this massive solar event did happen 12,000 years ago, it seems it caused an explosion inside the pyramid power plant. Maybe it also wiped out all the evidence and artifacts, all the traces left behind by whatever civilization was destroyed. It's feasible that 
thousands of years later, the Egyptian people decided to repurpose these strange structures, transforming them into tombs, leaving behind all those fourth dynasty artifacts that led archaeologists to the conclusion that they were the ones who built the pyramids. Circumstantial evidence can be misleading. That's why it's often not admitted in a court of law. Is it possible that ancient Egypt, what we think about as an advanced ancient civilization, the advanced ancient civilization, was actually a post-apocalyptic backslide? Maybe. It's not what we were taught, so it's hard to wrap our heads around, but there's actually a lot of evidence to suggest it that can't be ignored. Graham Hancock has theories about construction of the Great Pyramid as well that explain some things mainstream Egyptologists have not been able to explain. He suggests that these ancient people used acoustic levitation, sound waves, to lift those massive granite slabs that are suspended above the king's chamber. This technology has actually been replicated in recent years. In 2016, a joint team of UK and Brazil researchers used sound waves to lift a 50 millimeter ball several centimeters off the ground, and it stayed suspended for as long as the sound waves were generated. The stationary sound wave they created basically canceled out the force of gravity. In 2017, researchers in Bristol levitated a two centimeter ball using sound waves. Now, These experiments are on a much smaller scale, but acoustic levitation appears to be physically possible. Do I know with certainty that an ancient apocalypse happened 12,000 years ago, wiping out an advanced civilization that levitated blocks with sound waves to build the Great Pyramid as an electrical power plant? No, I don't know that with any certainty. But do I know that the Great Pyramid was built 4,500 years ago by 20,000 ancient Egyptians as a tomb for the pharaoh Khufu? I don't know that either, not with any certainty. These are both theories, not facts. It's easy to say, oh, that's not possible. It had to be ramps and mud. It just had to be, because that's all we understand, ramps and mud. That's the extent of our knowledge of physics. But just because we don't understand the physics behind it doesn't mean it's physically impossible. The Great Pyramid reeks of lost technology, whichever theory you subscribe to. You have to admit, They could do more, much, much more than we give them credit for. And this lines up much better with the ancient apocalypse theory than it does with the fourth dynasty of ancient Egypt theory, a period of time about which we actually have pretty decent written records. It wouldn't be the first time advancements in technology were lost. After the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 AD, we forgot how to make cement. We knew it was a thing from surviving Roman monuments, but we didn't know how to make it again until 1414, a thousand years later, when some manuscripts were discovered explaining the process. So yeah, there are precedents for this. We want to think that human advancement works linearly, that we came from the primordial ooze and have just gotten smarter and stronger and better ever since. But what if that's not the case? What if advancement is more up and down than that? What if we backslid so far 12,000 years ago, almost to the point of extinction, and we're still just climbing our way back to where we were before? I can't give you any concrete proof of that. No more than I can prove Khufu's body once lay in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. But it's important to keep our minds open to the possibility. I think we're hesitant to accept this idea, even when the evidence suggests it, because if it's happened before, this de-evolution of mankind, it could happen again. And no one wants to believe that's possible. They'd much rather believe that we used copper chisels and muddy ramps to build the pyramids. And now look how far we've come with our cranes and our skyscrapers. Look at all this progress. Surely we will continue to advance this way. Because... The alternative is terrifying. Thank you all so very much for listening to History Fix. I hope you found this theory interesting, and maybe you even learned something new. Be sure to follow my Instagram, at History Fix Podcast, to see some images that go along with this episode, and to stay on top of new episodes as they drop. I'd also really appreciate it if you'd rate and follow this podcast on whatever app you're using to listen. That'll make it much easier to get your next fix. Information used in the episode was sourced from NPR, the Australian Museum, 
teslasciencecenter.org, a History Channel article, a Smithsonian article, the Y Files YouTube video titled Tesla Knew the Secret of the Great Pyramid, a Graham Hancock interview on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast, and a megalithic Marvel's podcast episode about the Great Pyramid and acoustic levitation. And links to these sources can be found in the show notes.